uh, just a couple housekeeping things. If um, uh, if you have any questions, we're we're really uh, talking about two kind of different subjects today. It's um, the first half will be on GP business alerts, and then the second half of the session is meant to be on the uh, uh, forecaster application and some specific functionality within forecaster. Uh, so we're we're hoping to take questions at the end of each section. So at the, about the half an hour mark, we're going to um, take a minute and, and uh, we'll uh, address any questions related to business alerts. And then at the end of the session, as we wrap up, we can take questions about uh, Forecaster and the Forecaster functionality that was presented. Um, if you have questions right away, um, please just uh, code them in, as Jen described. Um, Again, my name is John Cooper. I'm Implementation Manager at uh, Crestwood Associates. And if you have any any questions after the session, you just feel like uh, uh, maybe sending me an email on uh, Forecaster or Functionality or whatever, uh, my email is jcooper at crestwood.com. So uh, please feel free to uh, to do that. And um, uh, you know, there there are no silly questions. Um, so with that, we'll jump into the um, uh, topics of the day are GP business alerts, and then we're also going to talk about forecaster tools. And for those who are not familiar, um, business alerts are a specific function within GP that allow you to monitor um, uh, for any kind of a data condition and send a message, send an email message to uh, a specific email address or a group of email addresses whenever that condition comes up. Um, so uh, some good examples of that might be uh, we have um, a, a customer that is um, uh, showing a balance that's greater than their credit limit would be an example. Or maybe uh, our checkbook within GP, the balance is going uh, below zero. Or um, maybe we have one of our priority vendors uh, that we're, we're showing a balance in a bucket that's uh, greater than 45 days. Anything along those lines. Something that uh, we can logically express as a, as a data question can be coded as a business alert and then whenever that data situation comes up we can have GP automatically generate uh, an email, typically an email to uh, uh, one or more email addresses, but we can also um, show that um, uh, alert as a task within the, the GP homepage for a specific GP user or a list of users. So that's what business alerts is all about. Uh, Forecaster is not uh, uh, a function within GP. It's a standalone uh, budgeting application. So Forecaster allows us to um, keep uh, the budget process in an application instead of dealing with budgeting is uh, uh, you know uh, several different versions of spreadsheets that are being passed around uh, by the department managers we have uh, an application that's holding everything so there's obviously there's benefit in that uh, no version control issues um, uh, forecaster has security for all the forecaster users so you're allowing users to see just the departments or uh, perform the functions that, um, that their position uh, warrants. Uh, there's a workflow capability. Uh, we can have users uh, getting into Forecaster using a web browser so uh, they can access their budgeting information and, and set budgets using Internet Explorer. They don't have to necessarily have the, the software installation. And uh, they're uh, probably the you know the main point of Forecaster is that it it allows us to hold so much more detail uh, related to each one of the the uh, line items that we're budgeting for. So instead of just saying salary expense for my department is going to be X number of dollars, <clears throat> we can track employee by employee detail and, and really get down to a very granular level of detail uh, in the information that supports that one budget line item. And that's that's a lot of what we're going to look at today. We'll look at the, the areas of detail that Forecaster allows and um, 
uh, how we can use those, I, I refer to them as forecast or subledgers. Uh, we'll also take a look at uh, different ways of um, having uh, various versions of a budget or, or um, some what if processing within Forecaster to allow analysis of, okay, what if we changed um, this area, uh, maybe bump that up by 3% or whatever. And uh, we'll also take a look at Forecaster reporting and, and a little bit of the um, functionality related to um, uh, Forecaster reports uh, beyond what we would typically see with management reporter uh, budget information. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to um, start, as I said, the, the first half of today's session will be related to business alerts. Business alerts are a function within GP and it's allowing us to monitor um, for a, a certain data condition and typically we want to send a message to um, uh, an email user or a group of email users as, uh, as that data condition comes up. And uh, we were just at Convergence last week. Uh, it kind of ties into one of the main themes at Convergence was this idea that um, businesses are trying to get smarter in the decision making um, that they go through every day. And we have all this, uh, this wealth of data within our uh, ERP systems. Dynamics GP holds just a, a ton of uh, really valuable data. And the idea that uh, we turn that data into more intelligence, better decision making, um, is, is the whole idea of uh, creating something like a you know, a, a business alert or just uh, uh, keying data into a, an Excel dashboard or uh, doing any kind of um, uh, smart list reporting. All of those things are meant to uh, allow for a little bit better decision making. One of the examples that they had at Convergence was um, uh, AccuWeather. Uh, the company is um, a Dynamics user and the, uh, the founder of AccuWeather was at Convergence talking about uh, a Pearl Jam concert that was uh, at Soldier Field and the fact that they had a, uh, a storm come up very suddenly um, wasn't in the forecast necessarily but uh, they could see that a uh, thunderstorm was going to hit the Soldier Field area. They were able to clear Soldier Field and get everybody uh, obviously off stage and, and out of the, um, the main um, the stands and the, the storm came through and actually um, uh, lightning hit the stage where, um, where Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam were, were going to be performing. So that, that was their um, example of one way that uh, you know, they, they were able to use the data uh, from, their, from their systems to feed some, some quick decision making and obviously our uh, accounting decision making is not always going to be that dramatic. But um, uh, you know, just that idea of turning data into okay, how do we proceed with the things that we we do running our business? Um, so jumping into business alerts, we we talked about different examples of what could a business alert be. What are the typical examples maybe of business alerts? So uh, one example would be a customer going on hold. Um, if we put a customer on hold, maybe a, a good example would be. Um, having a business alert sent to the salesperson that will let them know um, that their, their customer is now on hold. Or um, if we have a priority vendor that uh, we've allowed a balance for that vendor to get a certain number of days old, we could generate a business alert to the um, department manager, the, the AP manager. Um, the example that we're going to use today as, as illustration is, uh, when a customer balance exceeds the credit limit that we've established for that customer. So that will be the example that we walk through. And um, uh, you can obviously, you're uh, in a good position to take notes as I present, but I, uh, just a reminder that I have a lot of these uh, notes summarized and a lot of good screenshots and a document that we will send out at the end of the presentation. So uh, don't feel like you have to uh, uh, do any screenshotting or, or excessive note taking. A lot of this will be in the Word document that we send out um, at the end of the session. Um, so 
finding business alerts in GP, um, it's an administrative function, so I'm going to change the view to the administration tab, and business alerts is right here in the setup window. So in administration setup, and we have um, business alerts right here. And as we jump into the business alerts wizard, um, the first question that we are asked is, are we configuring a new business alert or are we uh, updating something that already exists? So simple radio button here. And for our example, I already have the, um, the business alert uh, that we're going to talk about set up. So we will choose to modify an existing. Uh, the second page shows us the list of all of the business alerts that are currently coded into the system. So um, you can see that in my sample environment, <clears throat> I have multiple companies, multiple databases. So the, the whole idea, of course, of the business alert is that we're monitoring for some kind of data. We're monitoring data, so one of the things that we need to decide is which database are we pointing to. And in the case of the example that we're going to use, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the customer balance uh, exceeding the credit limit, this is the one that we will uh, take a look at today, and, and this is um, the database that it's linked to in my sample environment. So we'll choose next, and here we're just choosing, this is where we really define what is the GP database, the SQL ID of the database that we're monitoring. We give the business alert uh, an ID and a full description, um, and uh, once we do that, we're on our way. Um, the, uh, the first real page of the wizard is maybe the, the only complicated uh, uh, or challenging part of establishing a business alert. And this is something that we deal with with business alerts or creating SRS reports or if you have access to Smart List Builder, um, figuring out which SQL tables hold the data that we're really interested in is, is the only tricky thing about the whole uh, configuration for business alerts. And as you can see, um, we have a good number of tables, obviously, that relate to all of our different areas in GP. Uh, in this case, we know that the tables that we're interested in are sales related. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is change the series to sales, and I'll um, uh, then uh, the business alert wizard is going to filter down the list of tables, uh, but it's still as you can see, kind of a lengthy list of tables. I don't know uh, uh, just off the top of my head which SQL table names I'm, I'm needing for the kind of business alert that I would want to code. So there's a little bit of a trick to helping users find the tables that they're interested in. And um, what we generally recommend is that in GP, the first thing that you would do is just simply go to the GP screen that shows the data that you're interested in. So I'm temporarily going to flip over to the sales background page within um, GP, and I know that there's an inquiry screen, the payment summary inquiry screen specifically, that shows all of the data that I'm interested in for this business alert. So I have the identification of my customer, what's the customer ID, what's the customer name, um, the customer's current balance, is listed here, and it also shows the credit limit. So I can see visually, all right, here's my credit limit, there's my current balance. In this case, Aaron Fitz Electrical is not showing a balance greater than the credit limit, but the whole idea of the business alert that is that I'm, I'm scanning the database, uh, uh, all customers, um, and I'm figuring out which ones meet that data condition. And this screen holds the data that I'm interested in. And so uh, something that we can do within a GP screen to um, figure out which SQL tables feed that screen is, and I, I should say as, as a preface to all this, that I, I think for, for our customer base, uh, we're certainly doing a lot of upgrades to GP 2015, and we're, um, we're seeing a lot of good functionality, good uh, new features with the newest versions of the system. For today's presentation, I'm using GP 2013, which I think is probably 
the most common version that's out there with uh, with our customer base. So this this is all uh, going to be very much the same in um, in uh, respects of configuring a business alert in GP 2015, but some of the specific, um, like the the, um, the banner, the ribbon at the top of the 2015 screens is, is, um, is going to be a little bit different. But these functions are going to be very much the same. Um, so in GP 2013, what we will do is click on Tools, Integrate, and Table Import. And table import, we, we don't necessarily want to do an import, but this select a table window shows us what are the SQL tables that feed into all of this data that we're seeing. And so I, I get a very um, uh, a quick list of the SQL tables that I might be interested in if I'm looking for any of these uh, data fields, and uh, I might at times have to do some investigation, um, but I know that in getting the uh, current balance, I can find that current balance in the customer master summary. Uh, the, the name kind of indicates that it might be summary information related to that customer. And then the, the customer master, the, the initial setup of the customer, is where I would be able to find the ID and the name and that initial credit limit that I had established. So for this business alert, um, it's not too bad. I'm, I'm going to just grab these two SQL tables, the customer master summary and the RM customer master, and those will be the tables that I work with in getting my uh, business alert coded. So I'll bring back my business alert screen, and at this point I'm scrolling down and I'm finding uh, the RM customer master as one of the tables that I've inserted, so I would highlight and insert, and as you can see, I've already done that for the two tables that we're interested in for this uh, for this query or for this business alert. The next page, if we have more than one table associated with our business alert, um, we need to know how to associate the tables together. We need to know how to join them together, and. Uh, that's what we're doing in this page. So we're identifying that these are the two tables that we have in our query, and we're going to think of a field or a uh, group of fields that will help us associate, okay, how, how do we logically associate all the tables, uh, all the fields that we would find in table one to all the fields that we would find in table two? Table two. What what are the common elements? How do we how do we bring them together? And in the case of our customer master and our customer summary tables, obviously the um, the thing that we can use there is the customer ID or what SQL shows as the customer number. So in this page, what I'm going to do is highlight the um, the customer number from both sides. and then I would find it over here as well. And once I've got them both highlighted, I can insert them and they will be then shown in the, the joined tables expression down at the bottom of the window. So we're, we're simply identifying a common element or a, a logical way to join the two tables together. The next page is, is really where we're, um, we're doing the, the, we're coding in the expression of the data that we would like to monitor. What is it we're trying to find within the GP database? How, uh, what, what would cause an alert to be sent out? So in this case, we know that our, in our example, what we're trying to monitor is any case where a customer's balance is exceeding the credit limit amount that we've established on the customer setup. And what we're going to do in this window is first um, identify the table. So the beginning of our expression that we've already filled in, as you can see, is the beginning of the expression is customer balance. And so we would find that in the customer summary table, the master summary table. So I'll identify that as the table that we're working with. And then I'll scroll down and find the customer balance. And I'll just kind of duplicate what we've already done here. I'll add that. And that will be the beginning of our expression. And then um, we want 
any situation where the customer balance is greater than the credit limit. So the credit limit is in the other table. So I'm going to switch my tables, go back to the customer master, and then I'll scroll down and find the credit limit amount. And I'll insert that. And so this, obviously it's just duplication of what we already had in, but that's, that's a, the uh, example of the process of putting the expression together. Um, we end up with the expression, customer balance is greater than the credit limit. So anytime that occurs, I want to then have GP automatically send that business alert out. I, I want um, either a GP user or a list of email users, doesn't even have to be a GP user. Uh, I want them notified that um, this data condition exists. So I'm going to take all that duplication out and we'll proceed to the, the next page. So now this is where we're um, identifying who is it we would like to notify? Who, who should know about this data condition? And we have a couple different options at the top of the screen. Uh, we can either send to an email address or a list of email addresses. Um, so if we do that, we, we are working with uh, Outlook in my case, or we would need something that's MAPI compliant. And um, we would then be able to use SQL Mail to automatically generate that um, um, email that's going to go out. And we could also, or as an, as an alternate uh, way of giving notification, we can specify GP users. So uh, within GP, we could set up a new task that would then show up on the home page of uh, any of our GP users that would indicate hey, there's a certain data condition that needs to be addressed. We, we probably need to do something in GP or possibly follow up with that vendor or that customer, uh, that employee to, um, uh, to you know, pursue or, or help resolve the situation. So that's, that's the other way to go here. In our, in our example today, we're just going to send an email out. Um, and I'm simply coding the email address here. Um, so I could say, um, you know, Johnson is maybe one of the people that I'm working with. So I'm going to code in that email address. And um, I'm, I'm not live on Outlook here, so I would have to re-sign in. But um, that would be uh, the way to uh, insert another email user into the um, into the business alert. So you can have one or, or many, obviously many, um, uh, alert recipients. And here at the bottom of the screen, I'm going to um, enter a, you know, some kind of a standard message that indicates what it is that I'm trying to tell the people who are receiving this business alert. In this case, I'm sending a report, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, sending a report, the attached list of customers have a balance in excess of their credit limit. So some, you know, something uh, relatively straightforward. And uh, the other option here, uh, besides what, what kind of user am I sending to, is an option for simply sending this message only, uh, in which case they're not going to get any data. Maybe there's a, um, uh, something that they just need to know hey, the, the checkbook balance is less than zero. So they don't need any, any report, any data. They just need to know, hey, this data condition is occurring, and OK, it's uh, um, something that we don't necessarily need to send a report for. Uh, in our case, it is helpful to send the list of customers, what are their specific credit limits, what are their current balances, and all that will be bundled into a report that goes along automatically with this email message as it kicks out. Um, so my next page then is what are the uh, data elements, what, what uh, kind of data do I want to show on that report. And in this case, it's the, the four elements that we had pointed out on the screen. Um, my customer number, name, what is their credit limit, and what is the customer's current balance. And very similar to what we had done on some of the previous pages of the Business Alert Wizard, we're going to identify which table 
we would like to um, find the, the data element and then scroll down and um, find the specific piece of data that we would like to include on the report. So one of our data elements was the credit limit amount. So I identify the table, the specific field, and then I can insert that. And as you can see, these four data elements have already been inserted. So those are, those are what's going to show on my report. Um, I have um, a sorting option here. So how would I like to organize the report? What order should all of these records show in? Uh, I'm picking one of the fields from the previous screen, and in this case, I, I chose to sort by customer name. And then the final page of the wizard is more about scheduling. How often do we want GP to check for that data condition? Uh, we can do something um, like a weekly send. In this case, I'm specifying that every week on Monday at 8 a.m., I would like GP to do a quick check of whether we have any customers that have a, a balance greater than their credit limit. And if any occurrences are found of that data condition, then it's going to kick out an email message and attach the report um, uh, in the way that we had set up in the business uh, alert wizard. And if I want to save all of this information, but maybe not turn on my business alert yet, the enable business alert option here down at the bottom, that's, that's our switch actually activating. It's, it's enabling it or turning on the business alert. So I can save all of this, get it ready to go, but not really turn it on if I'm not ready to do that. And I've also um, got a test alert button here that allows me to, um, even though it's not Monday at 8 a.m., maybe I want to do uh, a quick check. Okay, it, did my, lo my SQL expression, did my logical expression of what data I'm trying to monitor make sense? Is it finding any occurrences? Uh, do, do a test run of this business alert. So that'll happen if I, if I uh, click the test alert button. <clears throat> that would automatically kick out a, a message to all of the users that I had named, either the GP users or the email addresses. And when I do that, um, the results of the business alert are going to look like this. So uh, we're going to get uh, an alert from such and such company. Here's the name of the business alert. Here's the, the message that we had coded into the body of the, the business alert to attach customers have balance and excess. And then if I open up, I've got a simple text file here that shows all of my customer numbers, customer names, um, uh, sorted by customer name as we defined, and then what are their specific credit limits, what are their credit balances. And um, that's what we're hoping to monitor. That is the, the kind of report that we kick out every, in, in our case, our schedule is every Monday at 8 a.m. But as, uh, as you can see from that scheduling screen, you can do it at, uh, at different intervals. You could have it kick out, uh, monitor every couple minutes. If you wanted to really consistently monitor for something, you wanted uh, uh, a check many times during the day or maybe at the end of every month, you know, whatever frequency makes most sense. So um, that is uh, a little bit about business alerts. The um, um, uh, one, one of the questions that we get, not necessarily related to business alerts specifically, but maybe more um, just general for administration uh, kinds of tasks within GP is, where do I find that kind of function documented? Where, which of the several GP user manuals does it talk about this? And for business alerts specifically, uh, we can find um, in the system setup user manual, um, in part, uh, chapter six, part six of that system setup manual, it talks about business alerts, kind of recaps everything that we've talked about here, and um, has the, you know, the, um, the help that you need. If you are trying to set up something, you have a quick question, you can refer to that manual, or you can, you can always reach out to us. So um, that is the first half of today's session. Uh, Jen, if you wanted to 
um, open it up for questions um, if there are any at this point. Thanks, John. If anyone has questions, please just type them into the questions area. We'll wait a couple minutes here and give people a chance to type them in, John. Maybe we'll okay. get a couple. Good deal. Good deal. Hope everybody's enjoying seeing the sun today. Yeah, it's a nice change from yesterday. It's not sunny where I am. Looking forward to the sun, actually. Oh, I'm sorry, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet it's sunny where Tiffany is. Where is Tiffany at? I think Tiffany is maybe in the southern part of that west coast state that we like to visit. Are you in anymore. Chicago area, John? I am in Chicago, yes. All right, I am up in Wisconsin, so it's very cloudy and overcast here. <laughs> I heard there was an earthquake in the Chicago area. I heard that too, yeah. But, um, um, that's uh, unusual for us, definitely. All right, so I have a couple questions coming in here. The first one, okay. do I need to reach out to the Crestwood support team if my test emails are stating SQL Server blocked access to procedure, or would that be more of an internal issue that she should reach out internally? Uh, I would say that most of the things that you're going to encounter in setting up that email, setting up SQL mail, are, are probably things that you could fairly quickly find online. If you just Google, uh, I, I hate to you know, shy away from any business, but if you do a quick Google of the specific error message, um, that's, that's what I did when I was initially setting up business alerts for this version of GP. And I'm, I'm not an exchange expert, but I, I think in probably five or ten minutes, I found the underlying cause, which was just that I hadn't set up some function within SQL Mail, and I was able to resolve it. Um, if uh, you know, don't don't want to get into any um, you know wheel spinning or frustration trying to do that kind of thing. So you can always reach out to Crestwood, but I would recommend maybe just a quick online check to see if there's a uh, an easy answer out there. And if not, then uh, please give us a call. Thanks. The second question. Uh, if you are a user ID that receives an alert rather than an email, where does it show and how do you access the report if one is sent? Uh, good question. So um, in the home page, there is going to be a, a new task that will show up. And um, what you'll see if you are the recipient of that uh, alert is that you'll, when you first log into GP and you land in this home page, uh, there will be a new indicator in this to do section. And uh, maybe an example of this, I've, I've got this um, uh, icon coded in specifically to uh, support this kind of idea, is that, um, you know, as I sign in, I'm getting an indication that I've got seven customers that are showing a balance that's a little bit more probably than, than what we had in mind versus their credit limit. And that um, icon allows me to jump straight into the smart list report that I have here coded to, um, to support showing the customers involved uh, a little more, more uh, contact information than what we had in our um, initial uh, email send. So, uh, you know, typical smart list report, you can add or remove any of the columns that you're interested in related to customers or customer balances. Thank you, John. That looks like it for questions on this part. Okay. And if right. people have further questions and we don't think of it till afterwards, you can always shoot me an email after the webinar also. Great. Okay, so with that, we will switch gears, and the second half of our presentation is related to Forecaster. And uh, for those that don't know, I think we introduced it a little bit at the beginning. Forecaster is our um, uh, standalone budgeting application that works in conjunction with GP, but it's not a function within the GP system. It's its, its own application. and. Uh, we'll switch gears and, and flip over to the Forecaster sample company. Um, this is um, uh, 
the budgeting app that we described at the beginning has got a lot more detail. It has uh, what I'll describe as sub-ledger areas of additional detail that support those summary line items uh, within our budget. It has uh, other ways of automating the budgeting for any line item. We can uh, code in allocations or uh, calculations that will support budgeting on a given line item. Um, uh, different areas of uh, the additional detail, the sub-ledgers that I, uh, I'm going to use that term. And I think all of them are illustrated nicely if we just pull open the, uh, the main budget entry screen. So I'm going to choose data input here. And the first thing that we see, and kind of a, a reminder of something that we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk about throughout this presentation, is that uh, we can have one or many different budgets that relate to any given fiscal year. So in this case, we've got our sample company is kind of back in the 0607 time frame. And you can see for each one of those years, we've got an initial budget and then maybe a forecast and even a, a what-if scenario that we're um, coding in and, and doing some uh, reporting and some adjustments to that. So there are several different versions of the budget. If you want to do a, a best case, worst case, or if you want to have um, some kind of a, a what if, uh, similar to what we'll talk about in a few minutes. All of that is um, uh, is very easy to do within Forecaster. Uh, so the first thing we're going to look at is our initial budget for 2007 and the layout of this screen that we're looking at, the budget entry layout, is it, um, it's a good illustration of the the different ways of supporting our budget line items uh, within Forecaster. So some of the line items are coded to um, just be kind of open and available for manual entry. So if I have a line item that I would like to manually enter, um, I don't have any supporting detail, I can, I can certainly always do that. Um, there are other line items that I might want to code in some kind of a calculation. So for postage here, we have a, a quick calculation that I've seen historically that over time maybe I'm going to spend roughly $24 for every FTE I have in any given department. So I've coded that in as a supporting calculation. I can see that calculation as I uh, click in the postage line and that line then is automated. I don't have to manually enter that. Or um, along with simple calculations, I can do a, maybe a little bit more robust, more sophisticated allocation. I have a corporate expense maybe that I want to roll down to all the different departments within my company and I can set that up to have maybe a little bit more logic with um, um, some tracking of variable uh, basis for the allocation or uh, percentages that I would like to apply to all the different departments. Um, all that's possible. And then uh, one of the main things that we want to talk about today are the different, what I'm referring to as sub-ledgers, or the different areas of additional detail that supports one or several of the budget line items that I have. So what I'm looking at here, this, this spreadsheet kind of entry template, it all relates to a given department. So in this case, in my sample company, I've got department 11010, which is my New York manufacturing department. And that's, um, uh, that's going to be the example. That I'm, uh, in a scenario, I'm responsible for, for the budgeting for New York manufacturing. And this is the template I would see. So everything here relates to New York manufacturing. And then line by line, I have all of the different GL accounts that I would want to budget for. I've got uh, some uh, salary related things and then some general um, office administration um, kinds of line items. And for some of the line items that relate to HR, as an example, um, as I click into salaries expense, I can see that that's a human resources related account. So um, that ties directly to the HR data that I have in the human resources tab. Or I have other subledgers, if I can use that term, to um, support other kinds of line items. If I'm doing uh, new capital expense uh, expenditures during the year, I can code in what are the 
um, what are the things that as the department manager I'm planning to purchase for the coming year and I'm, I'm budgeting the depreciation expense for those or I have maybe more open-ended revenue and expense templates that I can code in. These are more uh, uh, user-defined templates that I can code that track all the details related to calculating what a revenue line or a group of revenue or expense lines uh, details that support the calculation, uh, maybe a more sophisticated calculation than what we did with postage there. Um, uh, so those are the three different um, additional areas of detail that we can get into HR, capital expense, or a little bit of a user-defined template with revenue or expenses. And um, each one of these is kind of the same idea where we're adding uh, the ability for the department manager to manage down to a, a really uh, a granular level of detail. In this case, the HR tab obviously showing us employee by employee. Uh, what um, is the list of employees that have some uh, time with our department, some of their uh, allocated time across the entire company relates to our New York manufacturing department. Um, for each one of them, what is their um, salary rate, when do we expect the merit increase to hit during the year, what kind of a, a percentage change do we anticipate for them, um, is there a bonus, are there benefits calculations that we want to get into, all kinds of, of uh, great detail that we can uh, code in here and uh, different categories of time, which GL accounts should the different categories of time go to. And all of these employee details are meant to allow the department manager to get a, a quick picture of what are the FTEs in their department. Um, maybe um, beyond the FTEs that we currently have, we want to budget for somebody that we plan to hire in the second quarter this year. So we could say, okay, I've, I've got um, an unnamed employee that I'm planning to hire, and maybe they won't be um, uh, on the books for all 12 months. They, they might be just from the fourth period through the end of the year. So we're, we're planning that hire as soon as we get into Q2 or something like that. So I'm, I'm managing at the um, employee line item level of detail, I'm planning for future hires, and I can use this as a way of getting a, a quick picture of what, what uh, payroll expenses I have that are uh, accruing for my department, how to manage my FTEs, and all that feeds over into my main budget tab and shows as a salary expense or might show as um, uh, something that's benefit related or um, the payroll taxes, uh, the expense that I have. So um, that's that's the idea of the uh, other areas that you see in the HR or the CapEx or the, the revenue and expense template tabs is that we're capturing a lot of additional detail meant to support what we end up with as one of our line items within the budget. Um, so here we have um, uh, salaries line item that we can see is connected. We don't have to manually enter this. We don't have to um, uh, code in a calculation per se. It's all driven based on the employee data or in the cases of the CapEx or the revenue templates, it's, it's based on all of the data that we're coding in for new purchases or some kind of a revenue or expense calculation in that last tab. So that's, that's a way of um, allowing the application to hold a bunch of additional detail. And, and all of these, I, I guess I should say that all of these are optional. If you, if you didn't want to get to that level of detail in one of these areas, maybe you didn't want to necessarily plan out all of your you know, purchases in the coming year, you could simply uh, use that as a manual entry row uh, for uh, depreciation or, or whatever kind of expense uh, that, that was going to be. Um, so these are optional, but they allow for a great level of detail, great level of supporting detail um, for the um, uh, for the line items that we have in our budget. And then uh, maybe hitting on that HR topic a little bit more, uh, when it comes to reporting within Forecaster, we have 
different kinds of reporting uh, beyond what you would maybe see in the management reporter, simple um, income uh, statement, actual versus budget, and the variance. We, we definitely have the capability of doing those kinds of reports, which we'll see in a minute, but uh, we can also pick up on those extra areas of detail. So if I wanted to get a report that showed me <clears throat> some employee detail by the different levels of my organization, maybe I could uh, uh, run this on New York manufacturing specifically, or I have the same kind of uh, reporting tree setup that you're probably all familiar with from Management Reporter coded into Forecaster. So I know which one of these department numbers are the the bottom level posting uh, level departments versus I've also got some summary roll-up levels. So instead of picking on just my one New York manufacturing department, I can get this report at the New York operations level, which is going to combine a bunch of different uh, departments all in that area of the country. And I can get a snapshot uh, for the entire organization or uh, different levels within my organization, depending on the reporting unit that I'm responsible for or interested in, and I can get a breakdown of what are all the um, employees, what are their salary expenses, how many FTEs are assigned to that area, um, and uh, that is configurable within Forecaster, so I'm, I'm able to get that kind of reporting on the fly as I make changes to my um, department as I'm in the middle of the budgeting process, I can um, open up any of my employee-related reports or the basic income statement, um, uh, actual versus budget kinds of reports, and, and get some quick feedback as I'm um, doing my work in Forecaster. So um, that idea of additional detail, one of the great benefits of Forecaster, uh, additional detail related to HR or CapEx spending or the revenue and expense templates, <clears throat> that was one of the features that we wanted to show off. We also wanted to talk a little bit about the what-if reporting within uh, Forecaster. Um, the idea that we're not only creating that first initial budget for the year, but then we also have the capability to very quickly, very easily spin off best case, worst case kinds of budgets or uh, uh, a three-month revised budget. We get uh, a quarter into the year and then we, we revise the picture a little bit. Uh, uh, can also process what-if scenarios. And to illustrate that, to kind of show that off, we'll go back into our data input uh, navigation and we talked about the fact that we are able to hold within Forecaster several different versions of the, um, uh, of the budget for any fiscal year. And we can see that along with the initial budget that we've been looking at, we also have a, a what-if budget. So uh, just kind of making some adjustments, seeing how that could possibly impact the, um, the budgeting outlook for our department or for our company and I can use the same templates, the same layouts. So I'm, I'm uh, borrowing from this exact look that I had in my original budget, uh, but now I've got a different data category for what if processing. And we can see that it's, it's the same look, but um, slightly different detail. So I've got, uh, uh, I've got the ability to take a snapshot of the original budget copy all that data into the what if, and then start playing with uh, different adjustments that I would want to make to the, the what if budget. And um, here I'm, I'm able to see the same layout, but um, now I'm, I'm interested in maybe opening up uh, uh, an adjustment function and updating one of the line items that I see here. So as an example, um, we can see that one of, the, um, one of the line items I have here is for commissions. So I've got commissions budgeted for 2007 as roughly $7,800. And what if I wanted to change that? What if I was wanting to um, provide a little bit more incentive for the, the salespeople in my department? I can go into my adjustments function in Forecaster 
And adjustments allows me to focus on any level of the organization or a specific department. In this case, I'm not going to choose a summary level. I'm going to choose my um, level, my specific uh, department, which is the New York Manufacturing, of course. And then I can um, process this adjustment for uh, one account or a range of accounts. Uh, just to illustrate here, I'm going to focus specifically on account 1140 for commissions. And then I'm able to change any of the data categories that I've got in Forecaster. So I could make a change to um, the original budget that I was looking at, or in this case, I'm going to change just the what if category. So I'm going to highlight all of my uh, what if periods. And here I'll say that I'm interested in um, bumping up by 10% the, um, the commissions that I'm paying out for this department. So I could, um, I could process this change now uh, immediately by just clicking the adjust button or if I wanted to do a quick review of what those changes would be before I officially post them, that's an option too. And for illustration purposes, I think it's, it's a little bit nicer to uh, have that review point. So I'm going to ask to view the transactions first before they're posted. I'll process the adjustment and we can see here that um, I would be adjusting by this dollar amount for all 12 of my uh, fiscal periods. So um, with that extra review point, I'm able to see that information and now if I uh, back out and process that change instead of the 7800, I'm going to uh, expect a, a little bit higher level of um, uh, compensation through the commissions line. So I'll post all those adjustments, go back into my um, what if budget. And now for commissions, instead of the 7,800, that's been bumped up by 10%. So I'm now seeing a little bit higher level of uh, uh, commission output. And uh, I can see through this uh, data input tab, how that maybe affects some of the other calculations if commissions was feeding anything else or, or possibly um, I can pull open uh, reports that would give me similar level of details. So I'm going to pick on my what if income statement and the what if income statement will um, again allow me a view of any level of the organization. So I'll start with New York operations which as we know, uh, includes New York manufacturing and other departments. And I can see, all right, how, how do all of those um, fiscal periods line up in, in terms of the budgeting that I've done. I can combine the, you can see along the top here that all of these first columns are what if data. And those are all listed period by period. I can also choose to list just one annual column. Uh, I've also got my original budget uh, shown here and then a variance between the two. Um, so these are the kinds of um, uh, quick feedback kind of reports that you can code into Forecaster, give you some uh, quick initial feedback on, okay, what, what does that do to the overall picture? If I'm doing a, a what if scenario, okay, what's my bottom line now uh, after I've made that change? And um, that's a good segue to the, the third kind of uh, area of benefit that we wanted to talk about was within reporting in general, um, we have this quick feedback capability within Forecaster. We can code these kinds of reports. Uh, we can also, um, uh, within the report, depending on how it's configured, provide drill down capability. So if I wanted to, I could drill down into commissions and I can see that um, uh, commissions is uh, uh, possibly a line item on uh, several different departments. I think maybe I've got bonus in more than one department. So we can see that um, bonus is hitting both the manufacturing and the material handling uh, departments. So I've got that same kind of uh, drill down functionality that you're probably used to in Management Reporter or FRX available to me within Forecaster. And one of the really nice features, I think maybe a, a thing that uh, 
I, I always like to talk about is the fact that within forecaster reporting, there's an edit mode capability, and it allows you to actually edit the data within the report view. So instead of toggling between the report and going back to that data input view that we were looking at, I, if I want to make a change, I'm looking at the report, I'm, I'm interested in making a change, I can make it right here within the report itself. So let's say that, as an example, I thought that um, uh, my, my February budget for a uh, bonus for the New York Manufacturing Department could be bumped up a little bit. So, so I'm going to, you can't see this of course, but I'm going to click into edit mode by hitting the F8 key on my keyboard. So I'll do that. And then that allows me to do some uh, data entry. So I'm going to change this from 8200 to maybe 10,200 just to make a nice illustration of it. So now um, I've made that change. As soon as I exit from this view, it's going to prompt me, do I really want to save that change? I'll say yes. And then um, I would just uh, refresh the report. And then that, um, that change has been made to the underlying data now. I, I didn't have to jump out of the report and, and go make that somewhere else. I just need to refresh the report. And I can immediately see the, um, the updated values uh, right there within my report. Um, so those, um, those are the functions that we were hoping to highlight within uh, Forecaster. Um, I'll, I'll open it up now. We, we were, again, as a recap, we were highlighting different areas of additional detail like HR, CapEx, or revenue and, te revenue and expense templates. Uh, we focused mostly on the HR for, for this presentation. Also looked at uh, what if processing, the idea that you would create a, a separate budget, uh, initially copying your first budget and then processing some adjustments, um, and the idea that we have this immediate uh, nice feedback with forecaster reporting. Uh, we can get um, the typical income statement kind of reports or the, the detail level reports like the employee detail that we saw. Uh, we also have drill down capability with forecaster reports and the capability to edit the data within the report itself. Um, uh, so uh, Jen, I guess at this point, are there any forecaster or any other questions? Thanks, John. I have one question that came in. Uh, can you use the adjustments feature on calculated accounts? Oh, that, um, that is a good question. I believe you can, but I, I will have to uh, verify that. Let me, uh, let me verify that, and I'll, I'll get back to the group with the answer, or, or get back to that person who asked the question with that answer. OK, thank you, John. Um, I don't see any more coming in. We'll wait a couple more minutes in case people are in the process of typing in a question. Otherwise, I want to thank John for the great presentation today and thank everyone for joining us. When you do leave the webinar, there will be a short survey that pops up on your screen, and we'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a minute and just answer those questions for us. Again, if you have further questions, feel free to email me, uh, reach out to us, and we will get some answers for you or get you help if needed. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jen.